Carlson strain gauges are then wired to the steel reinforcing every 10 feet. The cables from these instruments are then brought to a central recording location before the caissons are filled with concrete. This operation completes the subsurface foundation work. However, the tops of the major caissons are still 24 feet below grade. Our next job is to tie these caissons together and bring the building up to grade. We did it with this concrete caisson cap. 24 feet in depth and 8 feet thick. The caisson cap serves as the foundation for the core of the building. 2,500 tons of concrete were used in this caisson cap being poured now. This whole scene is typical of the construction industry. Huge 20th century trucks roar up and dump tons of concrete. Then men with little buggies take it away typical of the 12th century. Here are a few of the men who made the job go. Mark Crane, the general contractor, and in the middle, Conrad Sterling, his field superintendent, and my partner, John Heinrich. So far, we have been occupied with the foundation and the core of the building. But while this work was going on, other things were happening too, such as work on the garage section of the building where this deck is being laid and these fiberglass pans being placed. When you're building a high rise, a significant part of the cost is getting the materials up. The first step in this process is building the hoist towers. Here you can see that gravity is on our side. This concrete is being poured into a column form which will continue the vertical structural members up from the caissons. Next we vibrate the concrete to eliminate the voids. We are now literally getting the building off the ground. And as you remember, the core is critical to this. At this point, it's three feet thick. And it steps down in thickness to a foot at the 50th floor and continues this way through the 60th floor. Encompassed in this scene is a history of the building industry from the years of Vitruvius to the 20th century. Let's stop at the top and go down. This is essentially the same way concrete was shaped by the Romans. What we are doing is first building a building with wooden forms, then with concrete. So we build it twice. On the floors below, you see the reshoring where the concrete forms have been stripped away 
and the rough end work is going on. Finally, on the bottom floors, we arrive at work being done in the 20th century manner. Mass-produced aluminum curtain wall being installed on a mass production basis by repeating the same operation over and over again. You can see how this wooden building is built first, always one floor above the rest of the building being built below, a slow job demanding field labor. But mass production depends on repetition. Instead of building our edge forms out of plywood and rebuilding them for each floor, we prefabricated them out of steel with segmented and coated sections. These forms were then used and reused from one floor to the next. This detail highlights the angle insert required for the curtain wall you see how it is embedded in the edge of the concrete. Now you see the same angle insert being put in place on the edge form. A simple clamp holds it in place. After the concrete is poured and the edge form removed, the clamp releases and the angle insert remains embedded in the concrete. Here comes the reinforcement for the concrete. This is where part of that cost of building a high rise goes, getting the materials up. 7,000 tons of steel were used for reinforcement in the building. the reinforcements going into place. At the same time, other tradesmen are installing plumbing and electrical work. And after the concrete is poured, here come the finishers. One of the most difficult engineering problems in constructing a tall building is how to keep it vertically plumb. With a rectangular building, the solution is easy but with a configuration like ours, we had to devise our own solution. Our solution was simple, a bomb site, or rather four bomb sites, one at the center and one at the end of each leg of the Y. By siding down through holes left in the floor construction to target several floors below, we could keep the building going straight up without corkscrewing. These vertical center lines allowed us to use Euclidean geometry to swing arcs. Here's how it works in actual practice. We establish our original center lines indicated by the targets on the ground floor. Then we used a level with an optical plumb to sight straight down and establish a new location for the target. This maintained perfect alignment from floor to floor throughout the entire job. It also allowed us to establish the basic layout points on the periphery, which are extremely critical.